Blessings to you, precious and beloved sisters. I have so enjoyed steeping in these rich and powerful Old Testament prayers over the past weeks. I look forward to doing that again today, another wonderful prayer. Um, this will be our official uh, last Awakenings video um, weekly. We will continue to have some um, opportunities. I'll be sharing some and sending out videos over the summer. Um, but for those of us who are involved in Awakenings, this will be our last official gathering this week. Uh, I have so enjoyed being with you, albeit remotely, during this um, these unprecedented days. Uh, but they're, I believe, coming to a somewhat um, phased end, and um, we'll, I look forward to seeing you in person again soon. Um, uh, we've had the opportunity to steep in these wonderful prayers and see God's heart and his design to save and to bless his people. A couple weeks ago, we talked about a prayer that King Jehoshaphat prayed in 2 Chronicles 20, and particularly we looked at verse 12. King Jehoshaphat uh, blessed God and declared the greatness of his God. And then in verse 12 of 2 Chronicles 20, uh, King Jehoshaphat prays this, We have no power to face this vast army, this enemy that's attacking us. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And we talked about the importance of our gaze and our focus in these days, that we set our gaze on Jesus, on his power, on his love, his care, on his faithfulness and all else will be put uh, in its rightful place. Um, and the word says that uh, God honored King Jehoshaphat's request with a magnificent delivery. Then last week we talked about a prayer prayed by King Hezekiah um, in Isaiah uh, 37, specifically uh, verse 20. We talked again about Hezekiah prays um, blesses God and speaks of the wonderful and wonders and majesty of God. And then um, Hezekiah prays, save us from this enemy that all the kingdoms of the earth, that the whole world will know that you and you alone are God. And God answers Hezekiah's request and there's an amazing rescue. Uh, these kings were not standing on blind trust. They are standing on who they know their God to be. They declare his greatness, and then they stand on his word to them, his promises. I saw a video recently that made me laugh and reminded me of this truth, how we are not standing just on blind trust. Watch this. Fall and we're just it'll be an exercise in building trust uh, between one another so Harrison if you don't mind going first uh, step up here on this chair and close your eyes all right and then everybody fill in and we're gonna ask you to fall and then they will catch you so you have to trust us I'm gonna count to three just relax and fall okay one two three no wait no no I love that video. We are not standing in blind trust, but we are standing on a firm foundation. The promises of our God and His commitment to those promises and His love for us. Today, I want to talk about another prayer in the Old Testament. It's short. The thing that's remarkable about this particular prayer is where it's located. Um, in the previous prayers by Jehoshaphat and by King Hezekiah, they are epic uh, stories of evil villains and mighty armies, and these prayers are wedged in these amazing supernatural videos. But not so with the prayer today. It's found in the book of First Chronicles, uh, the fourth chapter. I wanted to give you a bit of uh, background. First Chronicles is an account of the history of God's people from Adam through King David. 
The book has 29 chapters, and the first nine of those 29 are, are um, set up to be just a genealogy, just what you and I might skim through or scan uh, that one person begets another person begets another person. Those genealogies that we see in particularly in the Old Testament. This one is outlining the lineage of David. It covers thousands of years and over 500 people are mentioned in this one genealogy. The first nine chapters of the book of First Chronicles. Uh, you know how a, a genealogy reads, Abraham begot Isaac, and the sons of Isaac were Esau and Israel, and the sons of uh, Israel were, and it, it goes on and on, the list does. Uh, we come to chapter four of First Chronicles, and it's in the middle, really, chapter four of this extensive genealogy uh, we're reading the beginning of chapter 4. Judah, the sons of Judah were Perez, Hezron, Carmi, Hur, Shobal. And this continues the first 44 names in chapter 4 of First Chronicles until you come to a striking statement in chapters 9 and 10 of First Chronicles 4. And this is how it reads. Now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bore him in pain. The Hebrew word um, Jabez means pain, or it literally means he will cause pain. Uh, that's what his mother calls this baby. And the passage continues, And Jabez called on the name of Israel, the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed, and enlarge my borders, enlarge my territory, that your hand might be with me, and that you would keep me from harm, so that it might not bring me pain. And it ends with these words, And God granted him what he had asked. Then the genealogy picks right back up with a list of names. It's a fascinating little account story in the midst of this vast genealogy. The account begins with the statement, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. And I didn't want to gloss over this because I felt like some of us might disqualify ourselves when we read that with the thought that we may not have lived as honorable a life as we may have wanted or what we think that Jabez lived. Um, that we're somehow disqualified. But to believe that is to believe a lie because those of us who are in Christ are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. It beggars belief, but we're not only forgiven as believers, the meritorious life of Jesus is accredited to us. We are forgiven and, and we are credited with the meritorious life of Jesus. We are clothed in His righteousness. We aren't worthy, but He is. And we are clothed. The story of Jabez isn't included in this passage because of the virtuous life of Jabez. It's included in this passage because of his prayer and because of God's magnificent answer. I love that. I imagine that Jabez was an overcomer. I think he would have to be an overcomer to have been somewhat cursed with that name throughout your life um, that he will cause pain. I don't know what his mother was thinking when she uh, gave Jabez that name, um, but I do know that despite the challenge of that, that curse that he carried with him through his childhood and into adulthood, um, Jabez became a man of true faith and belief in a God of miracles. It's hope for all of us who lived under false labels. Jabez called upon the name of the God of Israel saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed, the first part of his prayer. Oh, that you would bless me indeed. I love that Jabez doesn't add any specifics to that. Actually, I believe he didn't want to limit God. He, um, he just asks, bless me. I think believing in all things at all times, God, 
would you bless me? He didn't fall into the predicament of many Christians, um, those that J.B. Phillips described when he said, your God is too small. I love the quote by C.S. Lewis. He said, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, and we are far too easily pleased. Our prayers are often too small. Jabez does not limit the power of his supernatural God. He just prays a big prayer. Oh, that you would bless me indeed. Oh, that you would bless me, he sang abundantly. Second part of his prayer, that you would enlarge my borders, that you would enlarge my territory. I agree with Bruce Wilkinson's assertion in his book, The Prayer of Jabez. He wrote an entire book on this little two-verse prayer. Um, I would highly recommend it. It's been a wonderful resource for me in planning this talk. And if you're interested in finding out more about this particular prayer, I would highly recommend this insightful book. Um, uh, Bruce Wilkinson says this, um, From both the context and the results of Jabez's prayer, we can see that there was more to his request than a simple desire for more real estate. He didn't say, enlarge my borders so that he would have more land, although I'm sure that's included in his desire in this prayer. Wilkinson goes on to say, he wanted more influence, more responsibility, and more opportunity to make a mark for the God of Israel. Enlarge my territory. He's saying, everything you've put under my care, O Lord, take it and enlarge it. I love that. I love that. Will you enlarge my territory? Wilkinson suggests a prayer something like this. Lord, add to my family however and whatever that would look like um, in the natural and in the spirit. Increase my family. Increase my borders. Um, cause favor to rest upon me in my key relationships and in my activities and multiply for your glory the influence of my household. Expand my opportunities and my impact in such a way that I touch more lives for your glory. Oh, that you would enlarge my territory. Next, he prays, Oh, that your hand might be with me. I imagine that this part of Jabez's prayer was strategically placed because if God was going to enlarge his borders, Jabez would need God's hand to be with him. Um, Jabez would need more wisdom, more discernment, more patience, more resources. Jabez would need more of God. So he says, enlarge my territory and oh, that your hand will be with me. Alan and I some years ago were speaking with a man who's a, a, a successful businessman in the church and we were asking him how his life was going, how his business was going. He appeared to be prospering greatly in those days and his answer really surprised us. He said, um, the business is doing well, but I have a discontent in my soul. Everything that I'm involved in, I could do by myself without God. Um, but I believe that God wants me to be out there taking on things that I can only succeed in if God shows up, if He causes me to prosper. And he said, I want to be out there doing those things. And in this season, I don't feel like I am. I was struck by that. He didn't want to lead a comfortable life, but he wanted to step out beyond the boundaries of his own limitations and walk a great walk empowered by our God. Bruce Wilkinson writes this, 
in a, the prayer of Jabez, as God's chosen, we are expected to attempt something large enough that failure is guaranteed. We are expected to attempt something large enough that failure is guaranteed unless God steps in, unless our almighty, supernatural, promise-making and promise-keeping God empowers us. Moses said when he was leading the children of Israel, unless your presence go with us, don't send us up from here, he says to God. But that you go with us, don't send us from here. Empower us, guide us, fill us. Paul prayed in Ephesians that we would be filled to the measure. I love that. Filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Oh, that your hand might be with me. And finally, Jabez prays, prays, Oh, that you would keep me from harm, that it might not cause me pain. Oh, that you would keep me from harm. The Hebrew word for harm, ra, can also be translated evil. Oh, that you would keep me from evil, from harm. It's Jabez's cry for protection from evil and from harm. I was reminded of Jesus um, when he was teaching the disciples to pray with the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Protect me from temptation, from godly oppos ungodly opposition, from oppression, from the grief and pain that evil brings. Bruce Wilkinson, in his book, um, suggests a prayer like this. Keep me safe from the dangers that I can't see. Put up a supernatural barrier around me. Protect me, Father, by your power. Direct my steps away from all that is not of you. Protect me and protect my steps. Direct them away from all that is not of you. Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand might be with me, and that you would keep me safe from harm. Let's pray. Lord, we echo Jabez's prayer. Oh, that you would bless us, that you would bless us abundantly. Lord, we put no restrictions on that. We won't ask specifically, but I ask for every woman, every person under the sound of my voice, that you would bless her indeed, that you would bless her abundantly. Oh, that you would enlarge the territory, the boundaries of everyone under the sound of my voice, uh, that everything under um, our care, each woman's, each man's care would be enlarged. We pray for blessing so that, that it would be a, a so that we through your strength and power, can bless this world. Grant us more influence, more opportunity to share the good news that we have so richly experienced. Prosper us in what we put our hand to, Lord. And we ask that your hand would be with us we thank you for your promise that you will never leave us nor forsake us. We know that you promise that in your presence is fullness of joy. So I speak that over each one under the sound of my voice. That we will, through your presence, know the fullness of your joy. That you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. That we would boldly move into our spheres of influence. Lord, that we would be change agents, blessing scatterers, and gospel bearers for the display of your glory. And that you would protect us, that you would direct our steps away from all that is not you and let us embrace your highest and your best for our lives. We thank you 
that you are faithful and for your magnificent, incomprehensible, unconditional love for us. We praise you and we declare you to be worthy. In the precious and wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.